It's Behind the Headlines. Uh, welcome. I'm Joe Shaw. I'm the executive editor of the Express News Group. Uh, we are the publishers of the Southampton Press, the East Hampton Press, the Sag Harbor Express, and the websites 27east.com and Sag, sagharborexpress.com. Uh, with me is my co-host, Bill Sutton, who is the managing editor of the Express News Group. Hey, Bill. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we also good morning. We also we have a terrific panel this week. Let's start with uh, Catherine Manu, who is the publisher and an editor at the Express News Group. Good morning, boss. Good morning. Good to be yeah. here. I haven't been on radio since the Maven, so this is really fun. Yeah, this is this is your debut on the show, absolutely. And and you know, note to readers, I will, or listeners, readers. See, that's where my mind is. Note to listeners, I'll be calling her Georgie because that is how we know Catherine. Uh, also with us, uh, Grant Parpin, who is the content director at the Times Review Media Group up in uh, Riverhead in the North Fork. Hey, Grant. Hey, how's it going? Good to be Good here. Good to have you as always. Excited. And uh, also making his debut on the show t- today. Uh, we're on his home turf. Uh, this is Michael Mackey, who is the local host for Morning Edition on uh, 88.3 WLIW-FM here in Southampton. Hey, Michael. Good morning, gentlemen and lady, and proud to be here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you on board. So, Michael, you actually, um, when we were talking about things that we wanted to discuss this week, I thought you had a great suggestion, which is, the, the way this off season, I mean, the, obviously the last year has been completely different from anything like anybody's ever experienced here, but yeah. it, this off season in particular is different because the demographics are so different. We have so many more full-time residents than we typically have in an off season. And I think everybody's sure. feeling the impact of that, right? Sure. Well, I would say for the January and February, there probably are twice as many people on the East End as there were for January and February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And I would say that since the formation of Long Island 15, 30,000 years ago, since the glacier dragged us down, (laughs) there's never been this many human beings on the East End across the Twin Forks in the fall and winter. This is really a historic moment. And what's very interesting is where do we go from here when we actually reach the end of the tunnel? Yeah, whether or not uh, a lot. We talked about that, I know, with some of the real estate folks about whether those people will stay or not. And uh, Georgie, I, I know that that most of them are saying there's a lot of comparisons made to 9-11. That was really the last time we had an influx like this uh, of full-time residents, people who actually moved here. And the difference now is that this technology that, that we're using to even record this podcast remotely uh, gives everybody the opportunity to work more remotely. And so there's a thinking that uh, folks who moved out here because of the pandemic are, are here to stay. A, a lot of them will stick around and become parts of this community. Yeah, I mean, I think about it a lot, you know, even though, like Michael said, we're kind of getting to the end of this tunnel with the virus pandemic as more and more people are getting vaccinated. I just wonder, given what we've just been through, how many people are going to choose to live in an urban environment again, if they have the option not to? Data shock? Data shock? <laughs> it's almost certainly going to be a new normal. <laughs> Um, Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, you also mentioned being able to telecommute. um, I think we've all learned this year that being in an office space is not necessary for many jobs. And so if you can work from anywhere in the world, you know, why wouldn't you, if you had children, for example, choose to work in a more rural setting where your kids are going to a rural school and um, you're not in that, you know, really close urban setting? Yeah. And Bill, that's what a lot of the real estate folks said uh, when we held our express session on the topic. They said that that happened after 9-11, even that right. then it, that a lot of people moved out here and became they, they sort of uh, discovered what life out here is is like and, and the benefits of that. And they made it they, they became part of the fabric of the community out here. Yeah, I, I think the estimate was that after 9-11, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the people that had come out that had fled out here actually stayed. I, I, I would think that that number is gonna be at least 50% and, and maybe even higher um, now. Um, again, and, you know, we, we did the real estate se- sessions and, and they, were, they were talking about how people you know, discovered you can get up in the morning and you can go for a run and you can be in 
you know, in this wonderful area that, that we live in and liking it and having a yard and having their kids playing in a yard. And as Georgie said, going to school and all that. And why would you, you know, want to necessarily give that up? I think obviously a lot of people from the city love the city. And, and as things start to calm down, you know, with, with the virus, that, that pull back into the city will, will be there as restaurants open again and theaters open again and, and that type of thing. Um, but maybe it's, you know, I think maybe it, it, it switches um, it switches around and, and rather mm-hmm. than the city being the uh, quote unquote permanent home and coming out here for the weekends, maybe it's it's East End becomes the permanent home and it's going into the city to experience that that culture, um, you know, when when you want to and when you feel comfortable doing that. That's 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 interesting. I think the big question is, how do we deal with with the infrastructure you know, moving mm-hmm. forward? That's definitely the question I want to get to. Uh, I did want to ask Grant, um, is this impact being felt similarly in Riverhead, the North Fork? Is, is, are you, have, have you seen the same kind of influx of residents that, that are out here now full time who might have only been part time? Absolutely. And I think the way we've measured it, uh, a lot of it is the impact on the schools. Um, and I think that will ultimately be the determining factor in whether people go back or, or not. Um, we... Uh, we saw the kind of community school, which is sort of the, um, the, the big private school out here. They had to open a new space. They have a hundred new students this year. They just about doubled or more than doubled their student population. Uh, even the public schools, which had seen a real decline in enrollment in recent years because of the so-called brain drain, uh, those schools saw modest increases this year, especially uh, Oyster Ponds out in uh, East Marion and Orient. That's just, that, that's all more significant. So some of the more kind of affluent pockets and the more affluent private school, uh, they, that that's where they saw the biggest numbers. Uh, it's definitely being felt. It's being felt in the real estate market, bidding wars. Um, and, you know, I think even a little bit Beyond the East End, my parents live a little off the off the East End. They live in the um, eastern part of Brookhaven Town, right on the border of Riverhead Town. And they, um, their neighbor across the street, put the house on the market. The whole block was just cars lined up. Uh, wow. They said day one they had an offer, and these are modest houses. You know, they put it on the market for four hundred. Day one they had an offer for four ten. Wow. Uh, and you know, three days later, there's still cars down the block and there's people looking at it all the time. So um, it's really, it, it, it's amazing. I think it's even beyond the East End, it's Suffolk County. You're seeing a lot yes. of people coming out here still a year later. Well, I think Absolutely. you're also going to see that reaction of like, as housing prices go up because of this big push out here, the, you know, everything just kind of pushes outward, if that makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. people who maybe were living in East Hampton who now cannot afford to find a rental in East Hampton, you know, have to seek housing further West. So, you know, that's going to be another result of all of this. You know, yeah, we, stuff. we talked about it, too. I mean, like, you know, Vera said, maybe we should put our uh, house on the market. And I'm like, yeah, but what are we going to upgrade to a house that we can't afford? That's I mean, exactly. <laughs> that is the problem. Yeah. And then you think about just the, you know, long term, what this does for you know, affordable housing, unless like, you know, local government gets active and starts to create this housing, help to, you know, do their part in creating this housing. I mean, it's it took what was already live. Yeah, it was already a crisis and it's just pushed it now into a level where uh, I really think it's it's a catastrophe for a lot of mm-hmm. families. I think we're, we're, we're there are just entire uh, segments of the community that can't find any housing that's affordable now uh, and have to make alternate plans to get out. But, you know, let's go back to Bill's point. You know, Grant, when you were answering the question, uh, your internet broke up a little bit and that goes to Bill's point. All of this has an infrastructure impact as well. We don't really have terrific cell phone service out here. We don't have really terrific uh, high speed internet service. Water is always an issue. Sewage is a problem. Uh, As Michael, as we increase the number of people out here in, in an off season, um, let alone here full time now. And then we have this, the, the usual summer uh, visitors coming in too. We are going to reach a cr- critical mass. Our, our, our roads, our, everything is just going to get overwhelmed, isn't it? It sure is. We're using alternate routes this past December. This past December felt more like late June. We're in a slight respite right now, but still there are twice as many people out here 
as we customarily have in January and February. And everyone, there's a there's a construction, a little mini construction site in Watermill. So when I leave here and drive to Bridgehampton, it's going to take me longer than it normally would. And uh, so what do we do in another month or so from now when uh, folks start returning and construction really picks up? There just aren't enough roadways. And of course, we have a new element coming forth that's going to bring us even more traffic. Which we will talk about shortly here. But yeah, I'd, I've seen more traffic this this winter uh, sitting in, in traffic right. at times when I've never seen that before. Uh, no, usually pretty- after Labor Day, there's a respite. You take a deep breath. And uh, this year was different. I'm not saying it's bad or, or good, but it certainly is different. And in fact, it saved a, a fair number of businesses out here on the East End. I don't, I don't, the restaurants are struggling, but any business on the East End, at least in the, uh, the Hamptons, where people can just walk in, get what they want and walk out, they've benefited uh, significantly from the exodus from New York. Yeah, I think that's true. Jo- Georgie, do, do, do we have to worry about this, um, our success being the root of our failure out here, that, it, that, that being such a popular area uh, attracts so many people that it starts to overwhelm it and make it a lot less attractive suddenly. I don't think it's going to become less attractive. I mean, the reality is because of the community preservation program and the fact that we have some of the most beautiful beaches in the entire world. Um, I just don't, I don't see it. I, I've never bought into the, there's just going to be too much traffic and people aren't going to want to come here anymore. I just don't think that that's going to happen. But I think even prior to COVID, you saw that we, had affordable housing crisis. We had major traffic issues, major infrastructure problems. Um, our volunteer fire departments and EMS services are really taxed. Um, and that was all before this big population boom. So it's like kind of sped up all of these problems that were already issues and now they're you know full-blown catastrophes. On the flip side though, a lot of local businesses like Michael mentioned have benefited tremendously from the population boom. I mean, you go into down downtown Sag Harbor on a weekend, it is like July. I mean, there are people everywhere and they are shopping. Um, The restaurants obviously in the winter have taken the biggest hit um, as a result of COVID, but I think there's a big business boom out here. And for the local businesses that were able to survive the beginning of the pandemic, they're reaping the benefits now. So, you know, there are pluses and minuses to the situation. I'm reminded of what Dick Amper of the Long Island Pine Baron Society inevitably says during any interview with them. We don't want to turn the East End into a, a suburban uh, up island uh, hamlet or region. He says people aren't uh, using, aren't going to Levittown as a get a summer getaway. So we want, we don't want the suburbanization of the East End. Uh, and that's, uh, that has nothing to do with the color or demographics. It just has to do with with volume and doing everything within our power to preserve the uh, rural character while accommodating folks. It's impossible, actually. It's a really difficult, yeah. challenging situation because if you want to preserve open space and, 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 and not build out, how do you provide uh, affordable housing? It's not impossible, but it's a tremendous challenge, and we're going to get into that more in just a moment. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what um, I wanted to bring up, too, when we talk about preservation and all this open space we have, and we talk about the need for local governments to really amp up affordable housing. I think we're just at this moment where the housing crisis is so severe that we are going to have to start talking about where some high density projects make sense. As much as none of us want that, and of course, you know, we want to maintain our rural character and the beauty of this place. I mean, what are we maintaining it for if nobody can live here? So at a certain point, we really are going to have to have those tough conversations. And I just, I really hope NIMBYism doesn't make that an impossible conversation to have. Riverhead's been kind of doing a, a decent job with that grant, right? I mean, you, you've got, you know, all those, the, the new waterfront developments and, and you know, high rise buildings with, with apartments. And there's the one artist building and the one that they're just finishing up now. Um, yeah. Are they a little bit ahead of the curve, maybe? Yeah, they are. I mean, and I think the um, residents of the town aren't necessarily happy with it. You know, they have a couple more in the pipeline. They have uh, they had a recommendation several years ago to cap the number of units downtown. 
And they're uh, with the number of proposals that they have in Riverhead right now, they're beyond that number. So people are upset about that. They're saying this is too much housing for downtown. Uh, I personally, I think it's great. Uh, my sister-in-law lives in one of those units and we had dinner there the other night and it's considered a studio. It's huge for or for what she's paying for someone in her, you know, she's much younger than I am. She's in her mid twenties and she's affording to live there and work there. And uh, it, what a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I think if more people were exposed to it and saw it for what it is and understood the opportunity that it's creating for a young local person, I think they would be more open to these ideas, but you know, to, to Catherine's point, I mean, we hosted a forum uh, last year or in 2019 rather on affordable housing and, and some of the people there said, you know, certainly the, uh, one of the builders there said, you can, I think you're going to have to take some of that open space, take some area where you've, you know, there's a, a large buffer, but it's, you know, an old farm or something and, and put something there. So it is kind of separate from everybody and you're using some of that space land that you preserve. Now, I don't know that that would ever get done. I don't know. You know, obviously there would be some, some laws that would need to be changed for that to happen, but it, it makes sense on some level. Uh, you, you know, know it, can't, it can't all be just the downtowns. There's not enough downtown on. Yeah, this. absolutely. The smart growth uh, strategies are great, but there's only so much that you can do in the, in the villages and hamlets. You know, to close out the topic, I, I will say two things. One is I think we have to define terms, too, because there's low income housing, there's affordable housing, there's workforce housing. Those are all different ways to say the same thing, mm -hmm. but they all are sort of slightly different uh, aspects of, of the challenge that, that we face. And we need all of them. I think all, all of those things are, are wanting right now. And, and I'll also make the point that one of the real estate folks made a real interesting point, which is that after 9-11, and we had that influx of, of new people moving here and becoming part of the community, it really brought some life to the community and brought some really smart people and people who were very active in, and a lot of good came out of that. So, I, I mean, I think we can we can be, be, we have to be careful. We don't dwell on the negative here. This, this wow. has the potential to be a real uh, renaissance for the region as well, um, because uh, we've attracted some really great minds, I think. I, yeah. You know, I actually, go ahead, go I, ahead, I actually had a uh, piece that's, that's in the new issue of uh, North Forker magazine that comes out this week. Uh, all these people wrote to us late last year about a woman who she came out here. It was a home they had purchased in Laurel that was going to be their retirement home. But because of the pandemic, her husband wasn't going to his office in Manhattan anymore. So they came out and moved out there and everybody in her neighborhood sent letters saying, we need to do a story on this lady that she came out here. She completely transformed the neighborhood, brought everybody together, uh, you know, was hosting, hosted an Easter service in her backyard for people of all different faiths uh, and has become a, a true leader of her community. Her name is Mary Sanchez in Laurel. And that's just a great example of someone who just kind of came out here and just instantly made her community better. So there is another side to that. Oh, they're coming out here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's great that, that we have that influx as Joe said and, and, and Grant said, I think we just need to be careful that, you know, that the new people coming in aren't pushing out. Um, you know, people that have, have, have been here generations and generations and, and locals that just can't afford to live here anymore. And I think that's the real danger that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Michael, you want a last word on this? Yeah, I uh, overall, I think the uh, I'm not one of these us versus them, the city, it's the uh, city idiots versus the locals. <laughs> I think we're all in it together. And I think we were much enriched in many ways by the exodus from New York. But it, doesn't mean there's not great challenges now and, and through the future. And affordable housing is a tremendous challenge. So, but I, I think you all gave a great overview of, of the situation. It's more good than bad, for sure. Uh, I feel like we live in a glorious bubble, actually. I go, home, I go home and watch the news and see people on food lines, and I mean on Long Island. So, uh, and in Riverhead the other day, they had a big turnout at Stotsky Park for people who needed food. So, while many of us are enriched, many are still struggling, but they were struggling before the pandemic, and we would be struggling much worse had folks not come out to the East End. And it's been sure. some year now, so 11 months, and it's a great experience. We'll remember it and document it and talk to our great-great-great-grandchildren about it someday in one form or another. 
Absolutely. This is Behind the Headlines. I am Joe Shaw from the Express News Group. I'm the co-host with Bill Sutton, our managing editor, and our guests today are Catherine Manu, publisher and editor at the Express News Group, uh, Grant Parpin, who is the content director at the Times Media Times Review Media Group in Riverhead and the North Fork, and Michael Mackey, who is the local host for Morning Edition on 88.3 WLIWSM. Thank you for letting us borrow your airwaves for a little bit today, uh, Michael. It's nice to be on your on your turf. Um, so this leads into the conversation about the big announcement uh, that we dealt with last week, which was that the Shinnecock Nation plans to construct a gaming facility on its territory just outside Southampton Village along Montauk Highway. They hope to have that open, uh, Bill. I think it was 2023, correct? And I, I, correct. the ground is going to be broken this summer on that. It'll be a Class 2 gaming facility, which is basically video terminals, uh, something comparable to Jake's 58, which is a state-owned, OTB-owned uh, facility up in Islandia. Um, so when we talk about the challenges and the infrastructure, uh, Michael, this this is the uh, the next big challenge, right? I mean, if if we we have to set some terms in advance, and one of them is people need to understand that the tribe has the right to build this facility. Uh, when they won federal recognition, they have had this right all along to build on that property, that 800 acres just outside Southampton Village. They've always chosen not to do that. They've tried to find alternate sites by trying to work with the state, but they say that they have been just con confounded by any effort to work with the state. And so they're moving forward with this. There's really nothing the state or local governments can do to stop it. So the next question is, how do we deal with it? And traffic is going to be a big question there, correct? It's certainly going to be. Well, we have a preview of what we might expect. It was the 2018 U.S. Open Golf Championship, and there were times where the traffic was so heavy that I had to park my car at the Roger Memorial Library and wait two hours before I could get back in and drive another three miles further west. It's, it's going to be a great challenge. And no, we can't legally or in any way uh, uh, stop the Shinnecock from doing what they uh, plan on, on doing. And most people feel that they uh, have a right to do it and they understand the need. Brian Polite, by all accounts, is, is a, a very articulate, uh, caring uh, person. He grew up here in Southampton. He's so, the chairman uh, of, the, of the Council of Trustees for the nation, yes. Correct. And he, you did a great uh, – the, well, he was a guest here last week, yeah. He was a guest last week. He spoke very eloquently and – and uh, for his people's plight economically and why this is necessary. But he also mentioned that, well, it's going to create another 20 minutes of traffic in response to a statement that Schneiderman made. Well, another uh, average of 20 minutes more traffic sounds about right. An average, but the median is going to be much, uh, much greater. It's a, it's a terrific problem. Let's put it into perspective. Construction starts this summer. So that's going to prove construction creates a lot of traffic issues. It's going to open in 2023. In 2025 or thereabouts, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital is going to relocate to the old Southampton campus in Shinnecock. And in 2026, in June, the USGA stages another U.S. Open Golf Championship. Wow. We have a lot to look forward to in Shinnecock these days. As long as you walk and don't drive. <laughs> that Shinnecock Hills is the place to, to talk about right now. Bill, yeah. what's what's the reaction been locally to the announcement? I we, we wrote about this, and it's been a little bit of a muted reaction. We didn't really hear the kind of out, outrage that we've heard in the past when the, when, uh, the nation's made similar announcements. Well, this I, is what I've heard in the streets, if you will. There are some people outraged by it. Most people seem sympathetic to the economic plight of the Shinnecock, but nobody seems to have uh, uh, any solution to the, the traffic issue. It appears to be impossible. They're going to hire. They're going to have three or four hundred employees coming in. Uh, how many customers does that project? I mean, it's it's. I don't know the answer to it. I know a traffic light and a little bit of traffic engineering isn't going to do it. We had the uh, we had New York State. We had. The uh, Suffolk County, we had the town of Southampton and their traffic engineers and all the resources at their disposal with the various police departments to take care of the 2018 U.S. Open Golf Championship. They couldn't handle it. They handled it very effectively before. In 2004, they built the extra lane. It was so successful, they kept it permanent. 
And for a few years, the trade parade traffic was uh, was was managed. But by the time we emerged from the Great Recession, the traffic on County Road 39 is so heavy and the spillover onto 27A is such that no matter how much engineering they did in 2018, they couldn't effectively deal with the U.S. Open Golf Championship and this international event drawing tens of thousands of people. They even use the railroad. The Shinnecock can't really effectively use the railroad. So it's a real challenge, and there has to be a lot of thinking outside the box. Affordable housing is is a part of it. Maybe the, the, the employees that aren't actually living on the reservation can be housed, so their commute is from the inside out, not from the outside in. But still, mm-hmm. the I don't know the I don't know the answer to traffic other than I yeah, you know I I, I I I agree with I agree with Michael but you know I, I keep I I'm reminded of, of something that you know that Brian played and also said is is you know there's been a traffic problem uh, on on the South Fork for the 20 years you know 20 some odd years that that I've been on on the South Fork and and you know it except for, you know, little, little pinches here and there that, that Michael just described, you know, our, you know, local officials haven't been able to, you know, to address that traffic adequately, but every, but now, and I'm not saying Michael, but, uh, you know, now people are pointing their fingers at the Shinnecock and saying, oh my God, you're going to make the traffic so bad. Well, the traffic's already bad. So the question comes back to our local officials, um, you know, state officials, county officials, what, what can they do to, um, to 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 see this coming and to kind of come up with some kind of traffic plan. It's not just going to be the casino, as, as Michael said. You're going to have the hospital there, and I think there was a traffic study, um, you know, as far as the hospital on you know on the, on the college campus and, and the traffic that that's going to bring. So maybe this gets incorporated into that. Michael's right. There has to be a plan. It has to be a big plan outside the box. Um, but it, but it, I I think you know pointing the finger at the Shinnecock and saying they have to come up with the plan is, is just kind of ridiculous. And to your point earlier, Joe, I, I think you're, you're right. The, the, the reaction has been kind of muted. Um, and, and we talked about this a little bit that, that over the past 20 years, um, you know, from, from the initial um, discussions about the tribe building a casino and granted they were talking about building like a class three casino on, on the Westwoods property in Hampton Bays where everybody was outraged. I, I think the tribe has done a really good job in those 20 years of educating the public, talking to the public, um, becoming becoming seen as more part of the community rather than a community outside the community, which I think they were for for a long time. And that's due in, in part to, um, you know, to some new leadership in, in the Shinnecock, some younger leadership that that has been um, that has met the challenge of getting their message out and, and getting their point across to um, you know, the community of, of what they need and, you know, and, and the poor conditions um, on the Shinnecock territory and how these different economic um, um, accelerators are, are going to help. You're talking about the, you know, the signs on, on County Road 39, a, a gas station up there, perhaps um, the uh, the uh, hemp, hemp dispensary, um, you know, that type of thing. So so I, I think that 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 people are, are more willing to um, Rather than than you know get in that fight stance, I think people have have um, are, are really willing and able to work with the Shinnecock to make make this a reality, make this happen, make this be successful for everybody. Uh, it's grateful. too late, I presume. It seems to me to help them find an alternative site and be, before they even get going on construction. So I, think I, I, think, tried, I think they, they tried, tried for. Said- for, yeah, for the years. tribe has said they'd be willing, but but the state has never engaged with them to to try and to make that a, a reality. I think the the tribe is still willing. Uh, Brian on the show last week said they'll listen, but at this point, their plan is to move forward with this because uh, any effort to have those conversations with the state has come to naught over twenty years. So, Grant, Grant and Georgie, I'm curious what you've heard just in general and reactions, not just from officials, but just from people. Um, if you've talked with people and gotten any kind of an idea of how people have reacted to this news, whoever yeah, wants so to go first. Go first. <laughs> sure. I mean, actually it, muted is like the perfect word for it. Um, you know, most of the people that I've talked to are very supportive of the Shinnecock moving forward with plans and they all mention traffic. Um, but I think it's it, fair to say that 
as Bill and Brian noted, traffic's been a really big issue here for a long time. Why we haven't um, developed any sort of like light rail or mass transit system, some sort of way for people to move in this area without a car, um, you know, is short-sighted on everybody's part. I know it's, it's easier said than done, but you know, we haven't, we haven't developed anything robust to deal with traffic out here at all in the last 20 years. So it definitely shouldn't fall on the feet of the Shinnecock, but most people that I've talked to are really supportive of this plan. Grant. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, first off, I'm just grateful that I usually book a blade and fly into East Hampton airport. When I go out there, <laughs> fly just directly over the land, I go oh, oh, that's, route around both forks. Uh, that's you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is, okay. You're um, one of one of them. Yeah. And my other joke that I had prepared here was um, <laughs> maybe have you guys considered a double decker highway? Like think Verrazano bridge across the uh, South Fork. The yeah. See, you joke, yeah. but I, I think that's actually was like proposed at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the best idea I heard, someone wrote a letter to the editor one time and proposed a gondola down the railroad <laughs> yeah. tracks that would there just carry people back and forth in gondolas <laughs> to the various spots. I think that, yeah, that was has some, some elegance. There was the, the, the big ditch too, wasn't that? Uh, uh, Steve Kenny. Hampton, Steve Kenny from Southampton Town Councilman had, had uh, produced kind of a tunnel. Uh, plan. And I think that was more from water mill, you know, out, out to East Hampton, you know, along <laughs> right away, but that sort was of a bypass. Yeah. Yeah. As far as reaction, I mean, I think from what I, I've heard a little bit uh, on the North Fork, I think people are like, okay, good. Like that's a little bit removed because for a while, you know, the talk was that the Shinnecox would build a casino at Epcal in right. Calverton, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in Riverhead, which in, in a lot of ways makes some kind of sense with that expressway access. Uh, the one thing, though, it doesn't really have direct expressway access. You kind of have to go. You're not going to go down Waiting River Road. It's a mm. two lane highway. Um, and otherwise, you go around by splish splash and back. That doesn't really make that much sense. And, you know, from talking to Dick Amper about it. 15 years ago, I remember him saying, there's no way we're ever going to allow an access road through the Pine Barrens there, uh, which would be, you know, probably the thing that makes the most sense, a new exit specifically for whatever it be, a casino, a theme park, something, some of the grand proposals that have been proposed for EPCAL over the years. Um, So I think people here are a little bit relieved that this is not something that is going to affect the North Fork. Uh, And maybe even just something that people who like to gamble can utilize. Uh, I do think there's concerns with the traffic. I think, you know, if you look at Jake's 58, I mean, that parking lot is never if you drive by that, it's completely full no matter what time of day, day of week. Uh, So I think, you know, some of that is going to end up. You know, in Southampton. So it's just, it, it's really fascinating. Uh, I, I, I think, though, there's a, a bit of a sense of relief up in these parts. I would say that the number of people who decide to use the North Fork to get around to East Hampton and Amagansett is going to increase mm. tremendously. So I don't think the North Fork is totally out of this, actually. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. There'll be more flying, there'll be more using the, the, the North Fork as an alternate route. It will definitely spill over. Yeah, so we'll no, it's true. Over. Definitely. Um, but in terms of having that, uh, I, I think that the on. idea of a casino at Epcal is not something that a lot of people support here. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's going to be a, a, a big footprint, uh, however it comes in. And I think we've talked a little bit about the location is not. And I found it interesting this week, uh, Brian Polite, the chairman of, of the Council of Trustees for the nation, acknowledged that's not the greatest site for this. Uh, right. right on the, the territory, uh, right outside the village, uh, you, you know, when there was talk about building a gaming facility, for instance, at Westwoods in Hampton Bays, the, the benefit of that would have been that you could have had an exit ramp right from uh, Sunrise Highway. It would have been a little easier to access it. This is going to require going on to side roads that are just not going to be ready. And, and Michael, as you've already pointed out, they're already overloaded with traffic just on a daily basis for everything. And, and now you're going to push casino traffic onto those small roads too. It's, 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 it's going to take some 
somebody needs to get on this pretty quickly to start thinking about how, how it's going to be dealt with, or it could really be a catastrophe um, just in a, in a sense of how we'll deal with the fallout from it. I'm not sure the facility itself is going to be uh, anything but beneficial to the region uh, in an economic sense. But I, I think that's one of the, the traffic is going to be the real big bugaboo on that. I, think. I, have, I have to believe with, um, aren't they backed by, um, is it hard rock? Uh, actually, they're they're involved with some of the fo- same folks. Uh, the Seminole Tribe um, is the owners of the Hard Rock. The partners of the Seminoles are also the partners with the Shinnecock. So they're not working directly with Seminoles, but the Seminoles do have some involvement. They're offering some advice, and uh, they seem to be supportive of the project. So, uh, yeah, I think your point being, they've done this. It's not yeah. like... And they're going to have to do some planning. I mean, I, I yeah. don't think that they're going to just <laughs> you know, build a facility without having any idea of what the traffic impact is and how to deal with it because they want people to be able to easily access the casino. That's a great so point. Yeah, but, but if you think about it, is there really anywhere that really would make sense that wouldn't be an impact? I mean, there's probably never been a casino mm-hmm. built that didn't have this sort of impact somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, um, many casinos are built on open lands where they the, traverse it um, much more easily. This is Montauk Highway is a, is a highway in name only. It's really just a street. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a not a great spot for for it to be put, but it's it, I, I recognize their situation. By the way, yeah. for the record, I like the monuments, the billboards. Yeah, I, I was going to bring that up, Michael. I, I have I will I will say this. I think that the monuments and the way that we initially reacted to the monuments and then lived with them for a little while and saw that that impact wasn't as significant as we thought it might be. I think that helped clear the way a little bit for when this was announced. I think everybody's reaction was, well, let's let's wait and see, because we were I think we all overreacted to the monuments a little bit. So yeah, I think we learned a little less of that. Personally, yeah. I think they're a little out of character, though, aren't they not? I mean, it you, seems you get like used something. To them. I like them. I got to tell you, they feel yeah. like a really cool gateway. And I, yeah. I have to say, there, there's a pride that goes with it, too. Yeah. And, and the tribe yeah. talked about that a lot. And yes. I, I confess, I confess that when I heard that back then, I thought it sounded like, well, that's an argument for putting up billboards. Is But no, I really do think those billboards are a statement of pride. And I think they really do. Uh, resonate with a lot of tribe members uh, that we are here and we are visible. And, and I think, I think it means a lot to the tribe and, and I've come completely around on that. I think it's a, I, I think it, it's a meaningful thing for na- the Shinnecock nation to have those monuments on the highway. So. so have I, and I'll tell you an experience we had right before the pandemic, my wife and I visited our daughter in Philadelphia on the way home was a Sunday night. It was a long drive You're crossing the, the George Washington Bridge and going through the Bronx and Queens. And we're driving. All of a sudden, we look up and we see the monuments. And we said, wow, we're home. It was like mm-hmm. when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so, comparisons to uh, the uh, Stargazer. Um, Stargazer. Yeah, that, it, that yeah. it's a sign that you've reached the region. So that's, a, the, you know, it's interesting how those things evolve. So it's funny because I think a lot of people who go to casinos, see that and say, wow, I'm home. I'm at the casino because (laughs) it evokes a casino entrance. (laughs) So this, this is behind the headlines. I'm Joe Shaw from the express news group, Bill Sutton, my co-host also from the express news group, a third person from the express news group today, Catherine Manu, our publisher and and, an editor there, Grant Parpin of the uh, times review media group in Riverhead, the North Fork and Michael Mackey of WLAWFM. Um, So, so, Grant, uh, this is where we move on to talk about a subject that I don't think, you know, but let's remember the show is behind the headlines and it's it's largely about letting people know some of the stuff that they might not know about covering a story like the ugly story that you've had break this week in South Hold. And I'm curious to get a little bit of a take from you on, you know, I think people really don't realize that, especially for local journalists, these are difficult stories for us to write, aren't they? Talk about what the story is and 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 the challenges of trying to report a story like that. 
Yeah, um, it's been really like no other. I mean, I've written these kind of stories before, but this one, the reaction, because it was someone so well known, so prominent in the community. Uh, it's the story of uh, Damon Rallis, who was the at one time the vice chair of the Democratic Party in South Old Town. He was the candidate for town supervisor in 2015 ran for an assessor seat uh, a couple of years later. He uh, was uh, uh, this week uh, charged with distributing child pornography. Uh, FBI showed up at his house Tuesday morning, raided his home. Uh, they found um, he admitted it to them uh, allegedly from what the uh, FBI has said that he did um, – uh, post pictures of child pornography, a photo and a video won't get too into details that um, uh, in a chat room on a social media app. Uh, and one of the other people in that private chat was an undercover FBI agent. When they raided his home, they found a hidden camera that mm. they were, they were still going through the images, but that he, I guess would point at the toilet in his house and also in bedrooms in his house. Didn't have any images of children or anything like that, or, or even family members from what I gather, but uh, we're waiting to see what kind of images those produced, but uh, certainly just really just kind of scary stuff from somebody that people knew. I mean, um, obviously, a good amount of the population voted for him for town supervisor, uh, someone that uh, is uh, he's an interesting character in South Old Town in that he's uh, he's very active on social media and very uh, sort of aggressive. Uh, pro you know, he's progressive and aggressive mm. um, and somebody that a lot of people um, and this is the ugly, another really ugly side of this is that there are people almost like celebrating this guy's arrest in mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people who didn't like him, yeah. um, which is really ugly and, and sad in itself. He's a town employee too, right? And he works at the town. He's in the um, building department and somebody that a lot of people deal with through, you know, real estate transactions. And so very, I mean, I've never written a story where I've gotten as many phone calls, especially in recent years where people don't call you as much uh, or emails and they're, they're different kind of calls. It's not people complaining that we covered the story, but you know, I got a call from a woman yesterday who she said she hasn't slept since she read the story wow. because he's someone she was in contact with and, and, um, and the imagery in it is is so disturbing. That's the thing. I think the allegations, and and we don't have to discuss the story. I think this will play out in the courts. Um, the but the allegations are are really serious. They're not borderline in any way. There there's a lot of real serious uh, allegations against them. And and that's the the thing I'd like to talk about is when when we have to report a story like that that you know is going to have such an emotional. Uh, response in the community, Georgie. Um, it happens to us all the time. Where, where you know, maybe not at that level. I think this is probably a ten on a scale of one to ten. But we we do think long and hard about how this is going to to detonate in our in our readership, and and it and it does it does lead to some lost sleep and and to a lot of stress on our end. I think a lot of people misunderstand. Uh, how we do our jobs and think that we look forward to big headlines like this. Yeah. And I, we do not, uh, we don't like reporting stories like this. It's our job and we do it, but, but we do think about those things. Don't we, Georgie? Definitely. I mean, I actually, so I read, of course I read Grant's story and I actually had to take a minute. Like I stopped and went and did something else and then like came back and finished it just because reading um, the specific allegations and some of the examples that were given, it was so hard to stomach. Um, and we, we actually covered a very similar case a long time ago, over a decade ago in Sag Harbor, we had a real estate agent from Southampton who was living in Sag Harbor. His home was raided by the FBI and very similar um, kind of content, very young children involved, um, you know, was found in that case as well. And he ended up being convicted of it. And it was a case we covered for, I think, about a year. And it was so hard, um, you know, to go back and revisit and the strong emotions behind it. And then also when you're reporting anything that involves children, you're or any victim at all, you're trying to be so careful because you don't want to re-victimize anybody, um, 
you know, and we talk a lot about that in terms of our police coverage um, Mm -hmm. in general, whether it's, you know, covering domestic violence um, that occurs or these very sensitive cases um, where people are victimized and how we proceed cautiously, but also how we proceed knowing that we have a responsibility to the public, which is really important too. Um, You know, this is a prime example. This is somebody, you know, who allegedly has committed this horrible crime, who's a public official and, you know, or was, was trying to be elected to public office and works for a public office. Um, You know, that's actually that that information is out there for people. That's a point I want to get into bill bill. I've been reading Grant's stories too. And Grant, I think you're doing a a remarkable job of walking that line, but, but if we didn't have the in-depth reporting that makes your stomach turn, I mean, you that gap gets filled sometimes with something worse. I think Grant, right. what you're doing is essential to the to the process to get real facts out there about what's being alleged and and or, not let it. Well, I, I, I think I, I, I think Georgie, you know, spoke to our responsibility. And I'm, I'm reading the story, and there's no allegations that that. I mean, this guy was so this guy was a, a, a Boy Scout scoutmaster, and I don't believe there's any allegations that that the two were involved, although he's been suspended from the Boy Scouts, obviously, out, out of caution. And, and, and you, you look back in history and, you know, scandals in, in the Catholic Church and scandals and, you know, in the Boy Scouts, th- those went on for, for years, decades, um, even because of secrecy, because they never came to light because. There, there weren't stories about them and, until it all, you know, until it all erupted. And, and, and those people, um, you know, continued to, you know, to, to do what they were doing. And, and it is our responsibility to inform the public so that those secrets don't continue and those offenses don't keep occurring and, and you know, and all that. And, and anybody who's had contact with this guy, um, with, with their kids, certainly needs to have a conversation with their kids and make sure that nothing happened there. And that's our responsibility. And, and, yeah. and, in this case. and Grant, Grant, Georgie talked about her visceral reaction to reading your stories. You have kids and you've had to write this story. Um, I imagine that that's been difficult for you. Yeah. Well, especially when you're covering the arraignment while working from home and your uh, kids getting off the bus, you know, Mm. (laughs) um, uh, where quick, where are the headphones, you know, but Mm. uh, the uh, it's scary, but I don't even think you have to have children to be sensitive to just how horrible these allegations are. Uh, A point you made earlier, Joe, if you don't um, uh, fill in the gaps for people and, and be more specific in describing what happened, uh, not even just worse things, but even some people will fill that gap with things that are sort of le- less. Uh, That's you, true, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we put the story up initially when he was arrested. We were able to confirm that and we put it up without much detail and people were instantly defending the guy. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. once the allegations were in there more and it was said that he admitted to the FBI that he did post those pictures and you know, he told the FBI that he, you know, the allegations come from something that happened in a chat room last April, but he said he had viewed child pornography as recently as the day before mm-hmm. when the FBI spoke to him. So this is obviously a serious addiction, something that he's been um, uh, dealing with and, um, you know, uh, involved in for uh, a while now. It's a job that we have to do to report that stuff, but um, it's not easy. It's it's never easy to talk about that kind of no, stuff. And, I, and I, think I do if think you, if you look at the criminal complaint, it's even more graphic. So we could have even been, I think we sort of chose option B of, of, mm-hmm. uh, of three options. Option A is you don't really say what it is. You just say what the charge is and let people fill it in. I don't think that's a good option. Mm -hmm. And the other extreme is to uh, report it in even more graphic detail. So I think actually, even though it's so graphic, what's in there, it's just because the charges itself, they're so heinous. It's not nearly as graphic as, as the criminal complaint is. Yeah. No question. So uh, we have a couple minutes left and I want to very briefly talk about uh, a story uh, that we uh, reported this past week. And we, it's actually the subject of our podcast, 27 speaks uh, Georgie there, the John Steinbeck house in Sag Harbor uh, went on the market this week uh, for $17.9 million. 
Uh, but I, I think it's, it's sort of awakened. Uh, I think people, pe- th- that house has sat uh, in trust since Elaine Steinbeck died about 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. Um, but it's really awakened a moment where people realize his, you know, things like his iconic writing shed uh, are, are really in jeopardy here of, of going over into private hands and being lost. Yeah, so um, the news broke that this property, which, like you said, has been in trust for a really long time, has hit the market for $17.9 million. Um, This is a less than two acre property. Um, It does have about 600 feet of waterfront. It's um, obviously iconic because it's John Steinbeck's. It's where he sought refuge from the city, um, you know, and really became a part of the Sag Harbor community. Um, You know, it's where the winter of our discontent was written. So, I mean, there's there's so much history, literary history there. And then as we discussed at the beginning of the show, we're also in the middle of this huge real estate boom as a result of the virus pandemic. Um, so um, immediately, of course, the reaction is, how do we save it? Um, do we look to CPF? Do we look to our local governments? Um, you know, if we can't, you know, purchase the property, which again, 17.9 million um, with the community preservation fund, you can only um, pay what the assessed value of that property is very unlikely it would get to that point. Um, So do you look at how you save the writing cottage? Is there a way to preserve it on the property? Um, You know, we've seen that in other historic properties in North Haven and Sac Harbor, where a new property owner agrees to preserve a historic structure. Um, Oftentimes there's a lot of um, pitfalls to that. It, you know, it's not always preserved to the letter of the agreement. Um, So this conversation is really just beginning. Um, The mayor in Sac Harbor said she was going to be reaching out to the family this week, um, you know, to see what, if anything, is possible. But it is possible that it'll just be sold into private hands and, you know, it will kind of be at the mercy of that new owner to decide what happens to it. You know, you hope that they would want to preserve the cottage for its value, for its historic value. But, you know, you just don't know. Yeah, well, Unless somebody uh, had, with deep pockets steps up, hint, hint, yeah. hint Bruce Springsteen. Hint, that, that was the conversation we had uh, in our podcast with Catherine Zoka, who is uh, the co-owner of Canio's Books in Sag Harbor and thus sort of a focal point of the literary, uh, you know, the literary presence in Sag Harbor. And um, she is the one who brought up the idea of someone like a Bruce Springsteen who was out here uh, and performed um, in honor of Elaine Steinbeck and obviously has the song, The Ballad of Tom Joad. Um, it, it means a lot to him. So you hope somebody like that might be able to step up and it may be the only opportunity to to do that. So I was thinking that now that Catherine and Gavin are big media moguls, that this would be their next <laughs> big acquisition, you know, <laughs> we, there's a great idea of that being a writer's uh, retreat that I think mm-hmm. is a, a wonderful idea that we explored a little bit. That's, that's in our podcast. That's 27 speaks that's available uh, wherever you get podcasts. If you want to hear a little more on that topic, we're out of time on behind the headlines. So I want to thank uh, my guests, uh, Michael Mackey. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate you coming on. We'll definitely have you back. Have you back soon. Grant, as always, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Georgie, you passed the uh, test. You'll be back sometime soon, too. <laughs> <laughs> and to my co-host, uh, Bill Sutton, thank you uh, for joining us, as always. Uh, this is Behind the Headlines. Uh, we will be back next week uh, with another conversation. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>